Y sin más dilación, les presentamos ya a la primera de las conferenciantes de esta tarde. Se trata de Francesca Ferlaino, descubridora de un nuevo estado de la materia, sólido y líquido a la vez. Así es, Francesca Ferlaino es especialista en física cuántica y lidera un equipo de investigación en la Universidad de Innsbruck, en Austria, que recientemente llegó a un hito en la ciencia, el descubrimiento de un nuevo estado de la materia, con propiedades sólidas y líquidas a la vez. Este fluido tiene la estructura de un cristal sólido y robusto y al mismo tiempo las partículas en su interior fluyen como un líquido al estar deslocalizadas. Azken urteotan, Ferlainok izen handiko sari eta intzatezpen ugari jaso ditu. Besteak beste, Schrödinger saria, Feltrinelli saria, Alexander von Humboldt katedra, Innsbruck hiriko zientzia saria eta beste hainbat. Ez da erraza, kuantikari buruzko gaia kondo azaltzea eta ulertzea, baina ziur gaude Francesca Ferlainok jakingo duela jakintzareko, jakintzarekiko duen grina gurekin partekatzen, ez da? Beraz, entzun dezagun, adi adi bere itzaldia, zero absolut tuko temperaturara hurbiltzen diren atomoak, etorkizuneko teknologia kuantikoen jarwerra. Francesca Engitorri, txalo ero bat, mesedez. So it's, uh, it's really a fantastic honor to be here. And, uh, and I would like, since I'm the first one of this, this afternoon, I would like really to take a moment to thank uh, uh, Pedro, Pedro Miguel Lechenica, for having really the vision of creating this moment of passion of knowledge. And I would like also to take the time to thank uh, Ricardo Diaz Muno and uh, all the team of Passion for Knowledge and the team of the, the NOS International Physics Center to make this vision being such a beautiful reality today for us. And of course, for us as a scientist, it's already very clear that all this needs support from the institution and so also from our side, I would say thank you to everybody. And now, so, Arancia Aldeon de Noi, eta Ongie Torri, Senziaren, Maitale, eh, Gusti Ei. Bienvenidos a todos. When I was invited to come here, I thought uh, uh, about what should I speak, uh, and I decided to bring you to a trip, so a journey with me in a fantastic new world, which is the world of quantum physics. And so we will go together on the, some main thought that were, let's say, uh, fixing the path of the development of quantum physics. And just at the end, I will tell you a little bit of what is our work. So uh, when we start a journey, it's very important what is the feeling that we have inside of us. And what better feeling I can convey by using the word of uh, Erwin Schrödinger, that was one of the founding fathers of the quantum mechanics. And uh, he was saying something, I think, very deep and very important, which is the task, so the task of us, of scientists, is not to see what has never been seen before. That's not the task, but actually the task is to Think what has never been thought before, thinking about what it's everyday life around us. And so this is the attitude, think different, think out of the box. This was the attitude of founding fathers of quantum mechanics. Indeed, although our reality is very beautiful, like you have here in, uh, in San Sebastian, um, in reality, this complex reality is made of very simple objects which are atom, molecule, and a photon. The photon are really small particles of light. Now, you might think that they are, you know, our reality is made of this elementary constituent, and they would kind of just be many of them, and that's it. But actually, that's not the case. So one is made of the others, but these two categories, the very small and our day reality, is extremely different in the sense that they follow different rules. Indeed, the world around us follows the rules of classical physics. 
while uh, atoms, molecules, and photons are following the rules of quantum mechanics. This word, quantum physics and quantum mechanics, was introduced about 100 years ago by a number of, uh, of scientists uh, in, the, in a German school uh, of Göttingen. And, uh, and actually, it was meant to give the sense that they would study the mechanics, uh, so, you know, the law governing the behavior of something which is very tiny and typically also very cold. Let's say temperature is not, uh, let's say, a desired effect in quantum mechanics. And, uh, and this was 100 years ago, and many, many things happened. And that so many things happened that since a couple of years, we are speaking about a second quantum revolution. And I will try to explain you in our journey together why we speak about quantum revolution. What is the point? And actually, in a few years ago, scientists around the world write down like a white paper showing the new opportunity of quantum physics, because some maturity in the understanding was also showing new door to be open and new opportunity. Just to give you a sense, a few years after this quantum manifesto, this white paper, so the European Union picked up the challenge and decided that quantum physics and the related quantum technology are one of these disruptive new technology, which should be supported by a flagship technological program. And since then, many things happen around the world and um, kind of we have a number of <laughs> development, and the word quantum became extremely popular and uh, very much searched on Google. And actually, you see that also the support of, uh, let's say, financial support to this domain of knowledge and science grow enormously. So by now, it's about worldwide about $22 uh, billion, dollars, uh, which are now invested in different way and in different country uh, about quantum science and technology. And of course, when such a, a big pressure is on the desk, there is also geopolitical dynamics. And indeed, that is an example in which you see the number of you know, patents that China was putting together in comparison with USA, and you see how much you know, these slopes start to become exponential. There is an interest, but now we would like to know actually why this is the case. And to do this, I mean, to answer the question why the physics of today became the technology of tomorrow, we need to do a step back. And I would actually do a very big step back. And I would go back to the 1920th century. And so why I want to go so far? Because that was the point in which the idea came that wave, let's say, can transport information. So the idea that actually waves are extremely important. So the light that it's propagating, uh, it's a wave. They transport uh, electric field, uh, magnetic field, and in the properties of the wave, how fast they oscillate and how strong they are, one can encode information. And this idea of transmitted information was extremely, uh, let's say, successful and powerful. And there was even this crazy idea at that time, OK, maybe we can send you know, information very far away. The world uh, immediately started to become smaller just because it was possible to connect. And how this uh, became true? Well, many scientists have contributed. Now I put one which is Italian, so <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, and that's my favorite example, which is Guglielmo Marconi, considered to be the father of the telegraph. And, uh, and uh, actually, in, to, in uh, 19... Just at the beginning, uh, the first year of the 19th, it was the first uh, transatlantic transmission via this telegraph. A few years after, together with Carl Ferdinand Brown, he kind of won the Nobel Prize in physics. But already, I mean, at the telegraph, sending, you know, message over big distance. Okay, which message? What is the language, an easy language? you know, that you can use in, in sending information. Well, this easy language we know, each of us know, have heard, that's the Morse code. 
Why I put uh, this example so far away, which has nothing to do with quantum physics? Well, because the Morse code uh, somehow is something which, let's say, convert the alphabet, A, B, C, D, and so on, in a sequence of just two symbols. One is short, and the other is long. Short, like A, is short, long. B is long, short, short. So there is this idea that by having two value, so by having something binary, just two value, one can encode information. And this is actually the precursor of the same idea that it's used to have the bit in our computer. So in our, co our computer, speak a language, a logic language of 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, this binary logic. There are two values. You can call it 0, 1. You can call it down, up. Or you can call it low, high. But it's always two value. A very complex information you can encode in a string of 0, 1. Maybe a very, very long one. And, uh, and now that's the logic. That's our classical logic, how, let's say, computer science works today or until today, <laughs> and uh, that's not enough. So the logic is a language. So now there is the language of 0, 1. This is working, is understood. But now we need an object which is able to speak this language, 0, 1. And in classical in computers and microchip, this object that speaks 0, 1, it's called a transistor. And actually, the first use of this type of computer, or big calculator, you might know from the movie of the Turing machine, and actually was a huge machine, here is just one, uh, one photo, that was used to actually crack, uh, let's say, a crypto system that was used during the Second World War by the German Reich. And, uh, and here, Basically, all these objects were precursor of the transistor. And, and inside uh, the Turing machine, uh, what you had, uh, it's, uh, let's say, this vacuum tube here. Pretty big, it's kind of uh, a little coin size, which were able to give two value, and so to calculate based on this logic. Then the technology developed enormously in the 50s, and you had the first transistor, much smaller. And after the development of transistors, Sister, there was another huge boost in technology that was the user. Uh, the use of uh, integrated circuit, very small piece which contain many many transistors. How many transistors do you have in the microchip of your computer? How many transistors are today in your computer? How many? So now you buy more and more powerful computer. How many of these objects that can speak 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1 do you have? Well, funny enough, there is an empirical law, which is <laughs> amazingly good to be empirical, which is called the Moore law. And so it shows in this graph that since the 70s to roughly today, every two years, the number of transistors, the small object, in your microchip, in, the compute, in a computer, is doubling. And today, let's say the most up-to-date, uh, uh, let's say, processor that you have has about, uh, you see, very big number, 50 billion of transistors are in this uh, integrated circuit. Okay, but then uh, something doesn't, you know, somehow, we have more and more of this transistor, the computer are becoming smaller and smaller, that sounds kind of strange. So we can ask, what is the ultimate limit? And then what does it mean, so more transistors, smaller computer? Where are we now? What is the limit? And now I show you two figures of merit uh, for the limit. Oops. And one is about the size. How big is now a transistor? At the beginning, at the vacuum tube that I show you were like a coin. And now we are going to size uh, which kind of go below the size of a bacteria. And the ultimate size of one of these uh, little transistors is kind of in the direction of a single atom. 
you can ask, okay, now how much current do I need to control one of these objects because I don't want to spend and have gigantic bill at home because I'm doing something on my computer. Well, also here, technology advanced quite well, and you enter in a regime that you almost need very few, at the limit, one electron to control. Size of one atom, one electron, the physics of the very small things, we are entering in the quantum world. We are entering to the necessity of asking ourselves what is the, the law governing this very tiny object. And this is to say that from the technological point of view, so the watershed between classical world and quantum world is getting narrower. Just because the classical work is hitting now the bridge of quantum world. But that's not the only story, okay? That's just one part of the story. And I will tell you the other part that actually interests me even more. And uh, I will tell you what does it mean, quantum? Because we speak about quantum a lot, but what it is? Maybe the first very important thing is related to the idea of energy. No? So our perception of energy is the perception of, for example, heating up something. You increase the temperature of something, the energy is rising, eventually the water is boiling, and eventually all the water is evaporating, we are giving energy. In our idea of energy, I can continuously give energy. But in the quantum world, the energy, you can just give it by one specific amount. You can, so let's say, either you give exactly this energy, or nothing happens to the system. What does it mean? If we want to heat up something in our microwave, and the microwave is quantum, and our food is quantum, it means that if you put one minute, then maybe you give two less energy and nothing heat up in your micro microwave. But if you give one minute plus one second, boom, it's sitting up. Pa, is a step. The idea is a step. Quantization adds a specific amount that make you increase the energy. Now, more technically, this is shown here. This black line corresponds to energy level. Let's say that the lowest one is zero, then you have a certain amount and a certain amount. This difference between these two values, this amount is the one that you need to give if you want to excite something. If you give less, nothing happens. And so if you see this on a more geometrical point of view, the continuous classical feeling of energy, heating and so on, it's kind of continuous, and when it's quantized, you need to give this step. That's very important, because now quantum objects are more protected. If I have something in one state and it's perturbed by some energy, nothing happens. It just needs really a lot of energy to be excited up. That's important. Another thing that is important is that you have lasers, and we already heard beautiful talk about lasers, and if you now shine a laser into one atom, you can, the atom can absorb this energy and make a jump up. So the laser light can, is a very precise tool to control, let's say, the energy and the and then the state of an atom. I am in the ground state, down, very low energy, nothing happens to me, or I am in an excited state. And now you see, now just let's focus into these two levels, A1 and A2. Well, let's remember what we said about the Morse score, what we said about 0, 1. I mean, you can think that these two levels are actually really a very good transistor, because you have these two levels, zero and one. But actually, there is even more, because atoms are a special object, and quantum mechanics teach us this. Because what is really the additional power is that you don't only, let's say, the level, the energy level of an atom, it's not only, it doesn't have to decide between zero and one. The incredible things is can the system can be a little bit here and a little bit here. It can be in both states 
simultaneously. This is the first extremely difficult and counterintuitive law of quantum mechanics that we call actually superposition principle. And this already tells you that something is completely new in the logic that you have in quantum physics and tells you that an object can be in you know, a state, can have both color, can have a certain part in the state zero, so the lowest one, and a certain part in the state one. And this is why, to, exp to explain the superposition principle, uh, many persons use the example of this so-called Schrodinger cat. So since the atom can be in both states, it's like saying that the cat closed in a box can be dead and alive in the same time. This is, can be, um, let's say, surprisingly, but that's a journey that we are doing together where we are accepting that things are not completely deterministic. Okay? What does it mean in another term? Well, if you are a human classical world like us, you have two doors, you have to go on the other side, you have to decide either you go to the right or, or you go to the left. It's deterministic. You are determining what is your future, either here or there. In the quantum world, you don't need to have such a deterministic decision. Actually, in the quantum world, see, because particles have kind of wave, a kind of wave and propagate, they can kind of pass simultaneously on both doors. They don't have to decide. We call this probability. There is a probability to pass on the right, the probability to pass to the left. But until you don't measure it, they are in kind of this superposition state of passing through both doors. And, uh, and so now, when you measure, I mean, you have a state, and now you measure, then you have a probability to be in one state, but there is a kind of a weight to this probability, or you have the probability to be in the other state. But then you imagine immediately that the value, it's not only 0, 1, it's 0 multiplied by a probability, 1 multiplied by a probability. Saying again in another word, uh, and hoping that one of these way will uh, ring a bell of this very strange word, uh, and for this strange word, I mean, there was a Nobel Prize in 2022 <laughs> really proving uh, some of the foundation like entanglement of quantum physics. To simplify, while the classical bit can take only two values, the quantum bit can take every value between 0 and 1. can take also 0 0.1. So you can imagine that it's much more efficient to put information in an object that can take any value. And so you need not so long string to encode complex message. And indeed, if you think about all possible combinations you could create only with 64 of these, actually this would be equal, you would need 10 to the 20, oops, 10 to the 10, that means this big number of classical bits. So it's really fantastic, it's very powerful, and we call this quantum supremacy. But attention, there is an attention here very important, although we might believe that the logic, it's really the quantum logic, and everything works very well, we need still to answer, in, in scientists need still to answer what is the proper quantum transistor. We have a language, but we need to find the proper object that is speaking this language. And this is really where there is today the technological race. I will not say much more on this. There will be another talk, I think, tomorrow about that. But I want now to point you out that the possibility of encoding information with this quantum bit is just one of the power of atoms. There is much more. Let me give you an example about this. We are still speaking only about one atom. And so I told you that the energy is quantized. I told you that you can use it for, you know, efficiently encode information. But actually, you can also make, uh, you know, particle oscillating. And now this oscillation is reminding you a pendulum. Pendulum should remember you about a clock. 
And indeed, the most precise clock existing, the one on which the GPS is based, and you have the recognition of your location in every single mobile phone, this very precise clock is a quantum clock, which we call atomic clock. You use quantum technology every day of your life, maybe without even knowing. And another example is not all the story, because now I always consider that the level, this distance, this amount is fixed, but actually you can change this amount. And that the distance between two energy levels is extremely sensitive to magnetic field around you. So sensitive to be the best sensor possible that one can create somehow. And uh, if you have a magnetic field, you would measure a difference in energy. F to give you an example, based on this idea of two level in quantum system, you can even think, I mean, you maybe know that the neuron in a brain is creating a very tiny, small magnetic field. And this quantum sensor of two quantum level can be so sensitive to measure this field created and the anomalies of this field. Or as I give you an, always an example, I kind of always uh, tell that in my experiment, in my lab, if I look at the atom, because I have a very cold atomic system, I can tell you where is the elevator of the building. I can tell you, ah, look, this energy difference tells me is in the fourth floor, the elevator. It's not very useful, of course, in the, in the experiment, but actually tells you how sensitive can be one atom. It's a sensor as well. And all this is the power that you have in a single atom. And uh, now imagine you have two. Wow, well, if one was so fantastic, two will be even greater. And imagine to have more than two, many more that you have many. What, what, what will happen in this case? What can we understand about life around us when we make the transition between one atom and a many body, so many atom quantum system. Now we have to really ask what is the phases? How do they organize? How do they share information between them? How efficiently you can, you know, correlate one atom here and one atom there? There is a completely new journey that we have to start. And, uh, but before this, we have a problem. And the problem is temperature. I mean, temperature means movement that you cannot really control of this atom. Temperature we don't like. Quantum physics don't like very much temperature. So 20 years of research, fantastic research, was about learning how to cool down a gas so you have several atoms in gas phase and to remove thermal energy, to decrease energy. And this was really a very uh, also genial idea, because uh, what physicists find out that by shining light, a laser with the proper color, we can stop atoms. A laser which has no mass can stop, can decrease the temperature, can decrease the motion of something which actually has a mass. That's crazy. And, uh, Let's say that we remove temperature. Now we will say, OK, you have removed temperature. Now everything is boring. Somehow things are not moving. It's everything frozen. No. Now something else happens. You decrease temperature. And what happens is that every single atom loses the identity as an atom. It loses the identity. It's really like this. And it be became a wave. When you decrease energy, you make this transition from the classical world to the quantum world, and every single atom starts to be delocalized. So it starts to be, has a probability again, to be in several places. So as a wave type behavior. And let's say smaller is the temperature, longer is this wave. And now, if you think about wave, uh, and you have many of them, uh, this wave can interfere. And when this interference becomes, uh, let's say, 
positive, that all together, this wave work together and put themselves together, what you have is another transition of a giant wave, which is called <coughs> Bose-Einstein condensate. It's a single macroscopic wave made of matters with about millions of atoms inside. They lose their identity. They are just part of this uh, gigantic wave. And this, is, uh, this was a big achievement in our field. Uh, but let me tell you, the way to cool down was a very challenging one. How, much, how cold should our atom be? And actually, uh, and actually, to give a sense of what is cold, because if I tell you, my, I need to cool down the atom to nanokelvin, to you would mean probably nothing. What is nanokelvin? Also to me, this nano, oh, okay, it's very low, but I want to give you a sense. And then to do this, I put a thermometer here. This is my scale that go to really very, 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 very low temperature, almost absolute zero to very, very high temperature. Imagine that on this scale of thermometer, the hottest place in the world and the coldest place in the world are just two point one on top of the other. The scale is so long that the hottest and the closest things that we can experience as human being, they are almost the same point. And now, where is the surface of the sun? Well, it's nearby. And what is the coldest place in the background cosmic radiation? Well, it's also close by. And where we are going with our ultra-cold atom is here. Should be really extremely cold, at a point that we can even not measure anymore temperature. And uh, to show you a bit how it looked like, in the experiment, we create a machine we build this machine, we manufacture, we have a beam of atom moving very fast, and actually you might notice that while they move, they are in this blue light. They are absorbing this light and they're getting slower down by the light. And eventually there are other light with other color that is kind of starting to collect all the atom in the center. That's gas. And this gas is kind of losing energy continuously. This phase is called magneto-optical trap, so it's still absorbing and emitting photon. You see that they move. And then, at a certain point, you are switching off all the light. Now let's see if it's coming. And you will do the last step of cooling. And the first Bose-Einstein condensate was in 95, was June 95, with this creation in which you see that suddenly all the atoms pick up and become one unique object. And for this, actually, there was uh, the Nobel Prize in Physics 2001 given to Eric Cornell, Wolfgang Ketterlet, and Carl Wyman. And this opens a lot of possibility because now you have quantum physics, but at the level not of one atom, which is difficult to master, but really at the macroscopic level. We have one million of atoms all behaving as one entity, one wave, one macroscopic quantum object. And what we are kind of doing in our experiment, it's a building up an object like this one that's really photo in our lab. There is a lot of mirror and a lot of light, and all this is manufactured at, in, at home. You cannot call a company and buy something like this. And, uh, and what we like is to use a specific atomic species, one atom of the periodic table, and we pick it up for the first time, an atomic species which is extremely magnetic which has a very strong magnetic field, and you know that magnetic interaction, you know, if you have two magnets, uh, let's say you feel the force even before they touch, and so you see that the atom, even if they are away, they kind of get connected by this long-range interaction. 
Uh, and so the, uh, the atom of choice for us were erbium and dysprosium. And we all like magnetic interaction. Stuff very interesting are happening, even playing with magnet in our day life. But now we don't have real classical objects. Every atom is a quantum magnet. And because of these properties, uh, you can see here that, in general, magnetic interaction make a natural tendency of peeling up or creating a structure. And so that's what was the key to observe a new phase of matter. And indeed, what we know in our classical feeling is that solid exists, liquid exists, and gas exists. But actually, quantum mechanically, much more than these three categories is allowed. And actually, you can have even a state which uh, it's in a gas phase and have both solid and liquid properties. And this is a state predicted in 57, called supersolid state, which is very difficult to, you know, to depict because it's really a state of matter where you have the crystal rigidity, so the atoms are crystalline rigid, like in a solid, but at the same time they can flow like in a superfluid. These two things together is really hard also for me to imagine, and the best imagination I got is using a, a Greek god called Janus, because Janus is a god which has two faces, one looking at the future and one looking at the past. The future cannot exist without the past. The past cannot exist without the future. And our God has a crystalline nature and a superfluid nature, but you cannot cut in two. And, uh, and actually, it was very much debated whether a solid can be superfluid at the same time. And there have been theorists in the 50s, as you see here, that said, OK, these two properties cannot be combined. It's a little bit like the Schrodinger cat, dead and alive. Here we have a many body state, crystal and, su and fluid at the same time. So there was a physicist very prominent saying that these two orders are competing, cannot exist together. And there were others saying, yes, that's possible. Quantum mechanics allows it. And actually, both these four gentlemen had a Nobel Prize, so it's a very high-level discussion. It's a highly non-trivial question, and there was a lot of experimental effort. And so recently, a few years ago, it was actually possible to observe the super-solid state using this ultra-cold atom. Thanks to their magnetic interaction, you see that a gas, it's really a gas, it's self-organizing, creating pattern like a crystal, like wave of density, but at the same time, each particle is indistinguishable and can flow everywhere. You cannot say which one is localized and which one is delocalized, like in a fluid. And then you can also have a very interesting pattern, so is that you have to figure out a gas that self-organizes and every particle can flow without any friction. And with this, I would like now to conclude and uh, to close our journey. I conclude with another sentence, not from a quantum physicist, but from Nikola Tesla. And they say, and I think that's important to keep in mind, that the scientific person do not, does not aim at an immediate result. We don't aim at an immediate result. But his or her duty is to lay at the foundation for those who are to come and point the way. And this, I think, was the spirit of the founding father of quantum mechanics and seeing how much have been developed since then. And let me actually end by saying thanks to my fantastic team in Innsbruck. We are having really a great fun, and I hope that the young generation will all become physicists and join this journey in their education. Thanks a lot for your attention. Thanks.